First of all, thank you very much, Neil, David, and Christy, for this incredible honor to have gotten to write this paper. Um, it really is a fair, fresh pair of eyes in my case. I mean, I learned so much writing this paper, but um, I appreciate that too, actually. So that was, that was a great thing, and also to be here. So, um, so anyway, so this paper is about a topic which um, is a broad topic. I mean, I take a particular perspective on it, but, but I think the topic is something that is very good to reflect on as the Fed turns 100, which is why has the Fed's approach changed so much over time? So if you, if you take the broad view, you know, at one point they focused on monetary aggregates. At one point they focused on, you know, who, what kind of lending is okay, what kind of lending is not okay. At one point they were sort of tolerant of inflation. At other times they've been completely brutal against inflation. I mean, so, so what, how can we think broadly about these really large changes? I mean, these are not like little changes. These are really large changes in the whole approach that the Fed takes to its job. And so, again, I have taken a, a kind of particular storyline, which I have then imposed on a bunch of these. So, so the, the mechanism that I stress is basically three elements. So, so first, something bad happens. Now, this, this is unfortunately true in economies. Bad stuff does happen. Uh, and then the, the next thing that happens uh, is that there are critics out there who basically blame the Fed. Now, interestingly about the critics that blame the Fed is that there's, u there's usually competition among the critics. That is, the different critics point to different things. And, and so this process leads to a kind of view that's dominant. And, and, you know, that view becomes like more or less the accepted criticism of the Fed's behavior to that point. And so it's not like one decision. It's like a pattern of decisions that gets criticized. I think it's more effective to say, you know, you have all been looking at the wrong variable. That seems more effective than to say on September 12th in a meeting that we never, you know, get to see the details of, you made a mistake. That seems, that seems harder. So, so it tends to be more a pattern. And then, and then the third thing that happens, and this is maybe the central part of the paper, is that the, the Fed then somehow becomes averse to repeating that pattern. And, and I have struggled hard with what the right word for that is, and I have settled on penitence, which has not ideal connotations, but it has one connotation which I really like, which is that the main thing you're supposed to do if you've committed a sin is not to do it again. And so, <laughs> and so in that sense, I mean, I just want you to hold on to that aspect of the word and not be too, you know, hung up on other aspects. So, um, so I have a handout which is going to get distributed, which has this. This is really just the last page of the paper. There's nothing that, I mean, if you've seen the paper, you've seen this. But, but to give you sort of a general sense of what this, how I'm proceeding. So, so basically, the criticized outcomes on the left, I mean, they're the things that you've heard of. I mean, the Great Depression, the Great Inflation, these have all been called errors by various authors. The two that maybe are not so commonly seen, seen as errors are first the initial decline, but of course, during the Great Depression, the initial decline was a very dramatic event. When you're in 1931, that was like an incredibly shocking thing that had just happened. And then the other one, which again does not get that much attention, is this 5760 recession, which first of all has two nice aspects. One is it comes right before the 50th birthday of the Fed, and so it leads to congressional hearings having to do with the 50th birthday. And then the second thing is these are the last recessions that take place before the Fed becomes inflation tolerant. And so I'm going to link those recessions to the tolerance of inflation that comes later. So anyway, so those are the declines. Then I give you the mistake interpretations and penitence. Let me, let me just keep moving. So, so first, how can you possibly prove that, that penitence mattered? I mean, is this something that is even like provable in a audience, to an audience like this? And so, so I would say there are like four elements of the so-called proof. So, so first is a timing question. You know, does the change in policy come after the bad outcome and after the bad inter of the interpretation comes to be accepted about that outcome? The second is the specificity. Is it the case that we observe the Fed really not doing the thing that they've been criticized for? And then the third, which is, I think, the hardest, is I prefer it if I can find somebody at the Fed actually expressing an aversion to that behavior. Um, and so, so I look around in the minutes and so on uh, in the records for that aversion. And then I do something which academics do is I beat up on other rationales, but I try not to do that too much today. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the truth be told is this is an incredibly hard problem. So many people have taken a stab at trying to explain various bits. Like the Great Inflation, there's a gigantic literature on. The Great Depression, there's an enormous gigantic literature on. Obviously, 
I'm not going to do justice to it, but I think it's fair to say that none of these things are settled matters. It's not like we know what led to any of these things. And so maybe there's room for you know, a little bit extra, which is what's being provided here. OK, so the initial decline. So anyway, so it was incredibly dramatic, 24% decline in industrial production from 29 to 30. And so what is the mistake? So I would say, I mean, I, I don't know the literature as well as I should for this period, but, but it does look like a single thing that people pointed to, several people pointed, like the largest error ever made by the Fed was this 1927 expansionary policy that basically uh, was led by Benjamin Strong, and, and the monetary history makes a big deal of this, and he was doing it mainly for international reasons, which fits with Barry's discussion. So in any event, the, the view after the fact, particularly by Governor Adolf Miller, who called it the biggest mistake ever, uh, was that this was just had been an error, that they had done this expansionary policy, and he went on to say, I'm satisfied that if the reserve system had its hand ties against too easy a yielding of the seductive expedient of inflation through open market operations. So, so he's saying, look, open market purchases lead to inflation. Inflation, he means asset price inflation. Then there wouldn't be all these speculative abuses and excess, which is what was the sort of proximate cause of the Great Depression, the abuses and excesses that uh, led to the stock market increase and then crash. Um, so now, uh, what's the aversion? It didn't work out so well. Um, well, the aversion is basically trusting banks with funds. Basically, the whole principle of the pre-1927 operations of the Fed was that you couldn't trust banks to do the proper lending. Banks had to be, con you had to make sure that they didn't do speculative lending. And so in 27, they kind of depart from that principle, and I'm saying, well, what happens in 31 is they sort of reinstate this aversion to trusting banks with extra funds, and that's why excess reserves come to be seen as a bad thing. And so so there are two things that they do. They, they have an open market operations program starting in April 32 that ends in August 32, and they get nervous about the excess reserves. And then they, when they see reserves going up because of gold inflows later in the 30s, they increase reserve requirements. And so, okay, so you see the specificity. Now, the, you know, do we see them saying an aversion? Well, what the best I can do is in the annual report, they say the board's action was in the nature of a precautionary measure to prevent an uncontrollable expansion of credit in the future. So that's like the fear. The fear is if we do a slight, you know, if we increase excess reserves a little, that may lead to an uncontrolled expansion, and we're afraid of that. Okay, so, um, so I'm not going to spend too much time debating other things, uh, what other people have said, but, but I just want you to know that there is a bit of a mystery here. The mystery this is trying to explain is why did the expansionists not win? There were plenty of expansionists in the Fed at the time, including the chairman, Meyer, who was very clear that he wanted an expansionary policy. And so, so anyway, there are these alternative views. I mean, the, the one thing, maybe the one thing I will mention is one alternative view is that excess reserves were seen as irrelevant. They were just seen as a waste. And I'm saying, well, that, that may be. For sure, many people said it was a waste. But when really needs to explain why they didn't do it, given that there were so many people wanting to do it, there has to have been something that was negative about them, too, in any event. Um, so, so then the effect of the Fed on the Great Depression, so off the Great Depression itself. So here is the influence of Friedman and Schwartz. So Friedman and Schwartz come much later in 63, and they finally explain to us what actually led to the depth of the Great Depression. And this becomes completely accepted. Uh, and so, in fact, Governor Bernanke apologized. So that, <laughs> so really, if you had not apologized, I may not have been able to write this paper. <laughs> so, um, in any event, uh, so, so the newer version is um, basically gearing policy to the riskiness of new loans by money-providing institutions. And, um, and so... So basically, uh, th there's some timing evidence, which I have in the paper, which is that in 53, there's still a lot of discussion about, well, this kind of, you know, the balance of the loan seems all right to us, that kind of thing, and that gets to be absent. I have actually, since then, a little bit, done, a little bit more work. So this is uh, counting the word loans in the FOMC meetings. So, so this is literally just a count of how many times in that year the word loans came up in discussion. And the reason this turned out to be a good choice, loans, is that loans tends to be associated with CNI loans, business loans. So it's all about the details of the lending that banks are doing. And you see that it declines very nicely uh, a little bit after the publication of the monetary history. So anyway, it's uh, timing evidence. Um, now, the thing that I think is most fascinating here, okay, is... It's not that we learn from the monetary history that money mattered. I mean, that 
clearly he had a great point that they had let money fall a lot and that that seemed like a bad thing after the fact, okay? And he had a good story. I mean, everything fit right. The thing that I find interesting and mysterious is why did the other thing disappear? That is, the other thing had some wisdom too. You know, there was some wisdom in caring a little bit about what loans the banks were doing. I mean, endangering the banking system doesn't seem like such a great idea. So, so and, you know, trusting the regulatory system to do it entirely. I mean, again, the, it's not that you can't tell the story, but, but it is remarkable that there was this incredible change in the attitude of the FOMC. And that, I think, is not so easy to explain. Why is it that you, you should have learned about a new variable, instead you learned that the old variable is something you should be averse to? And so, um, and so this is where I say, well, maybe critics are just more successful in creating penitence than they are in creating excitement for their new idea. Uh, I mean, Friedman said both things. And in some sense, he was more successful with the second part, not be concerned with the credit market <clears throat> than with the first. Okay, so uh, the, the last thing, this is literally just a second, is of course Friedman Schwartz had another influence, which is that in the current Great Recession, <clears throat> liquidity providing institutions were mostly saved. So obviously that was another aversion. I mean, the, there is a aversion to letting the money supply shrink, that's for sure, in the current environment. Okay, so, so then the 57 and 60 recession. So, so basically, in the 50th birthday, it's kind of amazing at these hearings, all the economists you've heard of, Paul Samuelson, Milton Friedman, and so on, they all agree, the Fed is way too independent. It should basically be controlled by Congress. Why? Because it is incredibly deflationist all the time. They have an incredible bias towards deflation. And obviously, that's only because these bureaucrats are in charge. If Congress were in charge, that wouldn't happen. Um, and, <laughs> and so, uh, so, um, so the mistake. So I think here there really were competing mistake explanations. So one mistake explanation was that the Fed just swings to excessive tightness at the smallest whiff of inflation. In some sense, they found a job for themselves in 1951, which was to fix inflation. And then they get so excited about the job that at the slightest whiff of inflation, they just jump on it. Uh, another view is that they just swing from one extreme to the other. They're sort of unstable, and this is basically what Milton Friedman says. Uh, and that's why they create recessions. And the last one is this Phillips curve idea. That they're just picking the wrong point in the Phillips curve. If only they understood, they would basically be tolerant of inflation and have more unemployment. And the thing that's fascinating, I won't have time to get into it, but I think it really is amazing how unsuccessful the Phillips curve is at the Fed. Even before Friedman publishes his presidential address, Martin is out there saying there is absolutely no trade-off. In fact, if the flips curve is anything, it's positively sloped. <clears throat> so that one does not work, but the other two really do work. And so, um, so basically, the, there is, I think, a new aversion to creating sharp recessions to fight inflation. And, uh, and so basically, I have... Um, Various little bits of evidence on this. I mean, first of all, Martin says the objective should be disinflation without recession. Now, maybe I think that the thing that I find more interesting about Martin is in my reading of him, he was actually a tough inflation fighter in the 50s. He said we should be up in front of inflation. <clears throat> and then as time goes on, he sort of loses the initiative. He says, well, let's not do it because maybe Congress will do it. Or, or he even says at one point, Oh, you know, I understand that you all would have liked me to tighten earlier, but I don't think that would have been a good idea. So, so I think he really changes. And so, I, I mean, this is excessive psychologizing on my part, but I think he may have been affected by, by this incredible criticism, which really was a barrage of criticism. And personally, this is not, you know, in the paper. I think it was justified in the sense that the 1960 recession was not preceded by a whiff of inflation, nothing. That is, in 57... Interest rates go up in response to actual inflation. But in 60, they go up because the FOMC says they think there's an inflationary psychology out there. And that's enough for them. So, I mean, I think it's reasonable for the public to have been a little bit shocked by that. And I think it's reasonable for them to have felt a little guilty about it. I mean, again, that's all my own psychologizing and not something that I can really substantiate. Now, Burns is a different matter. Burns really, I mean, he criticizes the 1960 policy himself before he takes office. And I think... Um, I think he really uh, was a, even more, if anything, more overtly averse to creating recessions, and there's plenty of that in the record. Now, the thing about Burns is that he is one complicated human being, and so, <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, you can find him saying in the same speech, I have, and there won't be time, but 
I have this, this one speech where he says three things that have been interpreted by different authors differently. Of course, I prefer my interpretation that he's a gradualist, and so that's one that I would have presented first if there had been time. But, but, but there's another interpretation that he felt trapped and he felt like he couldn't cope with inflation. There's another interpretation which says, get ready for pain. The last one, by the way, is the one that fits the best with the moment in which he said it because he actually did cause a recession in 1974. But, but I think... I think the range, I mean, I think that if you said, was Burns averse to causing recessions, I think that's a fair statement. I think beyond that, he really said many things, including that he didn't think monetary policy could matter. I mean, he, he, he really did say a lot of different things, and so it's, it's very hard. Okay so, okay, so obviously I won't have time for this. Is, is it really true that the 1960 recession caused the great inflation, which is not a standard view, so I have a long list of alternative upper views. What's clear is that Milton Friedman uh, did explain why there was a great inflation, and he said it was because the Fed focused on the federal funds as an intermediate target. That was his idea. And, um, and so what happened? Well, when Volcker takes office, it is not the case that the Fed feels penitent about the great inflation in general. I mean, they don't like it, but they, they are very much stuck with this gradualist viewpoint, which is quite dominant in the FOMC. And it's not like they're all ready to go and have a gigantic recession to kill inflation. So Volcker has to get it through. And the scheme that he uses to get it through is basically to have um, these new operating procedures. And what I say is that the mistake interpretation was that exceeding money targets was a direct consequence of using interest rate targets. And then the procedures are the solution. And... um, and, of course, other arguments are given for this, not just my argument. And so, uh, so what is the evidence that they had a new aversion to interest rates moving? So, so I'll show you the evidence because you'll see the kind of things that convinces me, but I don't know whether it would convince you. So, so as I was reading the FOMC meetings, I concluded that I had found utter disbelief at the idea that you would fix the interest rate and allow the money supply to go up. So this happens in, 19, in 18, 1982. It's way later. The federal funds rate is nearly 15%. The CPI has grown by way less than before. So the real interest rate seems super high. And unemployment rate is enormous. And Parti says, let's have a limit of 15%. So basically, he's saying, let's cap the interest rate more or less where it's now. And, what's the, and he says that's not so unreasonable because, I mean, after all, 15% is a big number relative to inflation. And what does he get in response? He gets Wallach saying, but if we got there, we would provide unlimited reserves. See, I think disbelief comes out of this, but anyway, that's how I read this. And, and then other people say, well, how would this differ from the pre-1979 practices? And, you know, Parti has to agree that it's a little bit similar. And Ford says, are you implying that there wasn't a change in October 79? So, I mean, didn't we already get over that? Anyway, so that's, that's, what the, that's the evidence. Now, there's a little bit of indirect evidence, which... Is, is very indirect, which is that when the 1982 disinflation is over, the Fed is not accused of having made a mistake. It is a fact that the monetary targets have not worked very well, and the people inside the Fed are extremely aware of that and discuss it at length, how velocity shifts have really completely messed up their money targets. But it's not the case that they have to respond to a public view of critics that they have made a mistake. And my indirect evidence that this mistake thing matters, that what the critics say matter, is that at that moment, they extricate themselves very slowly. So I have various bits of evidence. I mean, for example, the interest rate targeting is something that evolves slowly. The Taylor rule is something that evolves slowly. And so, um, so basically, um, so, so I would say that here, uh, the, the lesson is that it's not that what this paper is trying to say is that when things go wrong, the Fed changes. What it says is that there is something extra that happens when the critics are able to establish that something was a mistaken pattern, that then the change has a different character. It becomes, first of all, more drastic, and secondly, has more of this aversive characteristic. So, So I have a concluding remark. I mean, one thing which struck me as I sort of pondered about what I had found is how much more successful critics are when they say don't do something than when they say do something. I mean, so Milton Friedman in this paper is successful three times. Three, you know, first he tells them not to focus on loans. Then he tells them not to be swinging back and forth all the time and causing recessions. And then he tells them not to stabilize interest rates. And each time he wins. His proposal of what the Fed should do has always been the same. But, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but the... the 
sort of accusations that are successful uh, vary. Okay, so I have to stop, but so I want to leave you with these two questions, which is the future, which, you know, I mean, again, you know, we are living through a period where things are not ideal and have not been. And I think it's unsettled which mistake, if any, will be blamed for that. And so the question I just want to leave you with is, will there be a new aversion if we settle on a mistake? And remember, this could take a long time. It took a long time after the Great Depression. And then the other much harder question is, what do you think prompts some mistake interpretations to be more successful than others? Thank you very much. Thank you.